Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India on uh, medical biomaterials, we will uh, continue on these uh, metals that is the metallic biomaterials. We have been talking about uh, metals, their advantages and so on yesterday, uh, we will continue on that. So, metals uh, they are able to carry uh, maximum amount of load when compared to say polymers or ceramics. So, wherever you have load bearing applications like joints, like foot, leg, metals are very good. Ease of fabrication, the metals have been in use for several thousands of years, so ease of fabrication um, is there. You can make very simple or we can make very complex shapes. Okay? There are several fabrication techniques, um, things like casting, forging, machining and so on actually. Okay? Uh, good fracture resistance, they have good very, very good electrical conductivity, especially if you are talking about lead wires, um, gold is quite commonly used, uh, they can be made formed into any shape. They are used in predominantly in orthopedic and dentistry, um, cardiovascular devices like artificial heart valves, blood conduits, um, heart assist devices, vascular stents and also in neurovascular implants. I showed you some pictures, for example, if you look at these, uh, these are titanium cages, um, you made up of pure titanium. Okay, so, these are used in uh, segmental bone defects. Okay, so, they have less weight when compared to solid piece. So, you can fill it up uh, with allografts. Allograft is uh, from the same patient, bone uh, fillings okay, and then they are placed here. Um, this type of uh, approach is adapted if the gap between the bone is too much. Okay. Will, that's called a long segment bone. We will talk about that later. Um, so titanium is widely used. Stainless steel bone plates, titanium bone plates, as you can see in these pictures. Okay, titanium bone plates or stainless steel bone plates are used, um, and they are connected to the broken bone uh, using uh, nails here. Okay, as you can see in this uh, X-ray picture. Okay, so bone orthopedic is one big area where metals are used. So, we need to little bit understand uh, this is called the bone. It is a dynamic and highly vascularized tissue and it keeps to continue remodel throughout the life. That means, bone can grow throughout the life, they can get remodeled. Okay? Um, they are involved quite a lot of in locomotion. That means, uh, when you move your foot and leg and arms and uh, rotate your arms, they take in lot of load. They are able to as you can see, some of the weight lifters um, in Olympics, they are able to carry several times their body weight. They protect the internal organ, like your heart, lungs, they are all protected by these bones. They are involved in hemostatis, that means they store calcium, potassium ions and they get liberated from time to time uh, for the uh, bodily functions. So, but then, um, fractures are a very big uh, concern, uh, orthopedic injuries it is called, it happens because uh, uh, in accidents, um, sports, age related, young people, so all these happen, uh, so bones break, so the that is a very big uh, issue, orthopedic injuries. Fractures due to trauma related injuries account for more than 1.3 million procedures in US alone, then can you imagine if you take the global um, it could be about uh, 50 times more than this, that is a big number. The total medical cost 215 billion per year with 8 lakhs bone grafting procedures. Okay? So, again you can see it is a big business, the medical cost. So, orthopedic injuries, bone uh, fractures, uh, replacement, filling up of bones, grafting, so that is a very large chunk of medical cost. And again age, as the population like some of the western countries, the population uh, slowly aging, uh, so age related injuries, osteoporosis, 
um, uh, injuries because of frequent falls. So, all these can lead to um, orthopedic implant or orthopedic surgeries. Okay? So, what is this long bone segmental defect? Okay? So, a long bone, a section of long bone is completely traumatized or absent. This can happen um, because of congenital disease from birth or this can happen um, because there has been an injury and it is not possible to fix that portion. So, there is a big gap. It can happen because there is an inflammation, infection. So, the part of the bone has to be removed or cancerous bone that has to be removed. So, it needs to be filled up. So, anything above 5 centimeter is called critical segmental bone defect. So, the body cannot heal by itself. So, if the gap is smaller than this, um, of course, the bones can grow and they can fill up, but then if it is larger, what do we do? So, we need to um, involve uh, by a lot of biomaterials. So, it needs specialized reconstruction as it is called. Okay? So, what are the main causes? High energy trauma, okay, accidents, revision surgery or removal of tumor, osteomyelitis, blast related injuries, developmental deformities. That means, uh, because uh, congenital, all these lead to this long bone segmental defect. That is defect in the bone, gap in the bone which is longer than 5 centimeter. Okay, so, how do they do it now? Vascularized fibular grafting. So, they graft it okay, in between. Distraction osteogenesis or internal bone transport with an external fixator. What do they do? They will externally pull uh, the bones and then um, allow those extended portion to grow and so on. They keep on doing that and it may take about 6 to 7 minute, uh, months for the bone to grow. So, they use an external fixator and keep doing that is a very difficult surgery and um, sometimes uh, the both the bones may grow, but they may not exactly meet then again there are problems. Okay? Uh, another approach using an intramedular nail. So, there is a long nail which runs through the bone from one end to another okay, and then the remaining portion may be filled up. Cylindrical mesh technique, okay? um, that means they keep a mesh, uh, cylindrical mesh filling up the gap, they may fill it up with the allograft as I showed you or they may fill it up with the hydroxapatite, calcium sulfate and so on, so that the gap gets filled, bone starts growing actually. So, these are some approaches here actually. So, what are the properties, material properties um, the biomaterials should possess if they have to work in the area of bone? Okay? So, mechanical stability, of course, that is the most important because bone uh, is taking up a lot of load. Okay? They, it should match the elastic modulus and ultimate compression strength of natural bone. Otherwise, if they do not match, if it is too much, then uh, there is something called stress shielding. Okay? So, they have to match uh, stainless steel, of course, does not match as I been telling you before, titanium and newer versions of titanium are slowly the elastic modulus keeps going down and down, so that they uh, come closer to the values of the bone. Okay? Architecture, they have to mimic the architecture of the natural bone. Okay? They have to exactly look like the natural bone, porosities and so on, shape and size and so on. Biodegradability, so it will be very nice, um, you keep uh, this biomaterial, once the bone has formed um, okay, and it completely disappears. So, it should match exactly, the biodegradability should be exactly equal to the rate at which the bone is growing. Okay? That is called biodegradability matching. Next is porosity. Okay? You need to have lot of pores um, and they should be interconnected because uh, we are talking about uh, the blood flow and so many things, um, ion flow. So, porosity should be around 70 to 95 percent, diameter of the pore should be 200 to 900 micron and they ought to be in interconnected so that the tissues can grow nicely and that is very, very important. Next, biocompatibility of course, they should not produce any adverse, this is natural, any biomaterial. So, they should not produce any adverse reaction uh, to the host organism, we have talked quite a lot about it, biocompatibility. Osteoinductivity, what is this osteoinductive? Okay, osteo as you know is related to bone, so it should promote stem cell differentiation through release of local growth factors. Okay? So, it should um, allow 
the local um, cells to grow, okay. So, that means it should be able to release the local growth factors. Maybe if you coat the surfaces so that they release the um, factors, then that is called osteoinductive. Osteogenicity. So, it should be able to produce new bone in the presence of osteoprogenitor cells, okay. That is called osteogenicity. So, it should uh, produce um, new bone in the allow it should allow to you to produce new bone and at the same time it should be able to um, release growth factors for the uh, bone growth okay osteoconductivity okay it should promote cellular attachment migration proliferation because once you have the bone cell getting formed there could be migration there will be attachment one with them and then there will be proliferation so that should also um, be happening promote Vasculogenesis. This means uh, we need to allow growth of new vasculature. That means we need to have allow it for new uh, blood vessels to grow, go through in and um, complete the architecture of the bone. So a lot of requirements, okay, for the material, biomaterial. If they, it has to be used for uh, bone application. Uh, please note uh, we have introduced uh, some new terms here osteoinductivity, osteogenicity, osteoconductivity. What is this osteoconductivity? It should promote cellular attachment, migration, proliferation. That means, cells should nicely uh, attach, proliferate and migrate. Osteogenicity, it should produce new bone in the presence of the progenitor cells. What is osteoinductivity? It should help uh, in the differentiation, cell differentiation um, through release of some growth factors locally. So, all these are important, the osteoinductivity, osteogenicity, osteoconductivity. And then of course, it should allow um, blood vessels to um, form and penetrate through the pores, so that finally, uh, there is a good interconnection of the blood vessels, okay. That is also very, very important. So, we have the mechanical properties um, bio here and here, here, biological properties here and here and then all properties related to the osteoinductivity, genicity and conductivity. So, it is quite a um, big challenge to develop uh, materials for uh, bone replacement. So, if you are talking about uh, bone replacement, there should be many criteria, appropriate tissue material interface. This is like a normal um, biomaterial uh, requirement. It should be non-toxic of course, it should be non-corrosive. We do not want corrosion to happen, uh, but that is uh, a problem uh, because uh, when we use metals and when we are talking about uh, uh, stainless steel, stainless steel can corrode adequate fatigue life. Okay. Uh, it should because um, when we are talking about a joint, uh, it is flexing all the time. So, it should be able to have good fatigue life that is very important. Proper design of course, um, density is very important. Uh, it should be of course, relatively inexpensive and then the elastic and mechanical property is comparable to that of the bone that is uh, very, very important. Okay. Um, I have showed you these pictures, the cylindrical titanium cage, it is used uh, nowadays uh, quite a lot, uh, especially when we are talking about uh, uh, long bone segmental defect that is greater than 5 centimeter defect. Uh, the beauty of it is this is a cage, so it is lightweight, it is titanium, titanium has lot of uh, um, biocompatible and osteo integration properties. Uh, so, one can fill this up with calcium sulphate or hydroxapidate or uh, um, aloe grafts of the uh, host um, and then fill up uh, the defective region. Okay, so, titanium and titanium alloys, orthopedic and dental good mechanical properties, high corrosion resistance. They do not corrode like stainless steel, excellent biocompatible and um, this is approved by the US FDA okay. and uh, from almost the year 1999. Um, these type of uh, long bone segmental defects are being addressed using this approach. Okay. So, it is an hollow fenestrated nature and it also um, able to take in the weight load of the individual 
and gives you the immediate limb stability. Okay, that's the advantage of uh, this type of uh, cylindrical titanium cage. And uh, nowadays there is even talk about can we use magnesium because magnesium and cylinders um, they are ha ha they are bioresorbable. That means uh, ultimately they can completely disappear, whereas titanium will stay in the body. So magnesium, whether it can be used, is being looked at. There are some research papers which talk about. Uh, use of magnesium for long bo segmental bone defects. Now hip, again um, metal, metallic biomaterials are used in this area. Okay. Uh, why? Arthritis, majority, fracture, dislocation, rheumatoid arthritis, aseptic bone necrosis that means uh, um, there are infections um, in the hip and uh, there is a death, so, then uh, revision that is from the previous operation. So, if you look here now again huge data 1 million hip replacements and 250,000 knee replacements are carried out per year. Okay. This is uh, US data that is a big number. So, um, use of uh, biomaterials metallic biomaterials in this area also again um, plays a very very important uh, role. Okay. So, there are uh, many requirement you no know, it should have long fatigue life okay if it does not have of course it's going to have mechanical failure so one needs to do revision surgery it is very painful time consuming expensive success rate goes down adequate strength that means um, if it is not taken there could be implant failure pain to the patient and revision again revision surgery so modulus should be equal to that of the bone that's a very important point um, that is why new designs of titaniums are coming up, so that the modulus of metal um, is not affecting uh, the modulus of the bone. Otherwise, if the modulus is very high, it is going to take uh, have stress shielding effects come into picture, loosening can happen, failure, revision surgery will happen actually, because the bone does not take in the load, where because the metal takes in the load which has got higher modulus, so the bone becomes um, loosened high wear resistance okay if there is a lot of uh, and joints wearing implant loosening inflammatory response destruction of the healthy bone okay the healthy bone also starts wearing because of uh, this okay it produces debris which can go to the blood and uh, if uh, um, a person has a toxicity relates to a say metal chromium or nickel then uh, he or she is going to uh, end up having uh, uh, other acute problems. High corrosion resistance. Um, so, releasing non compatible metallic ions and allergic reactions. So, if uh, um, the corrosion resistance is low, it starts giving out a lot of uh, unwanted biocompatibility. So, if not fulfilled, there could be adverse reaction uh, in the system or osseo integration. Okay. Otherwise, uh, what happens if that does not happen fibrous tissue between the bone and the implant that means if there is no integration between the metal and the bone and there could be a um, gap. So, there could be tissues formed poor integration of the bone and implant and implant loosening. So, if the integration is not good there could be implant loosening. So, as I said uh, the total knee replacement we are talking in terms of 250,000 uh, persons in US uh, getting knee replacement. Okay. So, these um, knees artificial knees contain uh, uh, three different parts and we have uh, metals, we have polymers like uh, uh, polyethylene. Okay. One is the femoral component. So, you can see cobalt, chromium, molybdenum, titanium alloys are used here. Okay. That is the femoral component. So, it is fitted. Um, so, you also have some poly using a polymethyl methacrylate uh, fixing. Then we have the patellar component. So, femoral component, femoral component, patellar component. Here, polyethylene, cobalt, chromium, molybdenum. So, this cobalt, chromium, molybdenum is coated with polyethylene uh, to reduce the wear resistance. Okay. Otherwise, it will be metal on metal. Um, so, there could be a lot of wear and debris could be released. So, that is why they coat with polyethylene. 
Okay. So, they fix again using PMMA because PMMA after all PMMA is used quite a lot in dental application, it acts as a adhesive. Then you have the TBL component, okay, so we have materials cobalt, chromium, molybdenum, titanium alloy, again it is fixed using PMMA, you see. So, three components, okay, there are three components here and um, you are using cobalt, chromium, molybdenum, titanium and then in here you are using polyethylene as a coating okay, or interface so that it prevents uh, the uh, metal on metal uh, rubbing, uh, it improves the wear resistance. Okay. So, this is how the total knee replacement uh, um, biomaterials are used and predominantly you can see cobalt, chromium, molybdenum and uh, PMMA is used as a fixating to both sides uh, on both the bones. Uh, where and you have the knee coming in between. Okay, okay so um, uh, it looks very complicated. Uh, what happens uh, to various metallic biomaterials in long term use in body? Okay, so this uh, was adapted from this particular reference. Okay, trends in biomaterial artificial organs. We have stainless steel. We have chromium cobalt alloys, titanium alloy nickel titanium, porous nickel titanium, okay. um, stainless steel, corrosion resistance is poor, chromium cobalt also is poor whereas titanium is highly non-corrosing whereas nickel uh, also can have uh, um, corrosion problems. High elastic modulus, again stainless steel has very high chromium cobalt has high elastic modulus, titanium has a problem, inadequate wear resistance, stainless steel also has inadequate wear resistance. So, that is why chromium cobalts um, are used uh, in the knee region. Okay. And if you take nickel titanium, inadequate contact with the bone and surrounding tissue, so osseo integration does not happen here. So, if you have uh, inadequate corrosion, so there is going to be release of metallic ions. So, redu reduction in implant life, toxic effect or in inflammatory response because you are releasing metallic ions. So, high elastic modulus you are going to have a high stress shielding, so there is going to be loosening of the bone. Okay. Uh, where if there is going to be high wear resistance, debris are produced, corrosion by friction is going to happen. Again this can lead to device failure, this can lead to inflammation, this can lead to loosening. Okay. So, if the inadequate contact with the bone and surrounding tissues, they are going to form fibrous tissues in between the gap. Okay. So, again there is going to be loosening because you do not have a good osseo integration. So, all these can lead to revision surgery, this is a very interesting picture. So, we see titanium, uh, the main problem of titanium is inadequate wear resistance. Okay. Um, so, they could produce some debris and corrosions and toxic effect, otherwise stainless steel um, has quite a lot of uh, disadvantages and chromium cobalt uh, also has some disadvantages although they are very good wear resistance, um, the elastic modulus is high, corrosion effects are also high. Okay. Uh, so, some of them have good uh, advantages, but there are some bad, there are disadvantages also. Um, so, it is like a challenge in selecting uh, um, or balancing between the advantages and disadvantages of various uh, materials. Okay, so, what do they do? Porous coatings because you need to have good pores okay, so that uh, the tissues, uh, the vascularization can ha happen. They are using bioactive ceramics, these ceramics improve the osseo integration, even bulk metallic glasses are being used. Okay, these uh, uh, inorganic material um, they are highly biocompatible, non-toxic and they are bioactive, so they allow the integration of the material with the bone. But uh, one problem of some of the ceramics is they can um, lead to infection. Tissue engineering approach, can I develop these tissues outside and brought inside, uh, so that uh, can I grow the bone uh, cells outside and then bring it and grow inside. Uh, of course, infection and other uh, contamination issues needs to be talked about actually. So, uh, if you look at the research, current research especially in bone, 
uh, osteo integration okay and these are some areas um, very good for research purposes okay okay uh, so we have a uh, bore metals we have uh, the polymers we'll talk about polymers later we have the ceramics okay um, these are properties you are looking at hardness elastic modulus temperature strength thermal expansion uh, ductility um, corrosion resistance resistance to wear electrical conductivity density thermal conductivity um, some of them are very high high low low high high okay both low or high um, we can also have very low okay so if you look at metals they have a low hardness high elastic modulus okay high temperature low temperature strength they have high thermal expansion high ductility they have low corrosion resistance they have low resistance to wear they have high electrical conductivity high density high thermal conductivity okay so the metals have these properties okay and polymers have different and ceramics are different as you can see uh, we at sometimes we need to have a miss a mix and match type of approach or coating of uh, um, non metals on top of metals to achieve the desired uh, property okay so that is how we need to do actually okay so if you are interested in uh, um, elastic modulus okay uh, if you want very high then we may go to ceramics or even high metals okay but polymers have much lower elastic, elastic modulus uh, if you don't want any thermal expansion then of course ceramics are very good because they are low okay if you want complete corrosion resistance of course ceramics are the best resistance to wear also is best okay um, density ceramics are low so obviously um, it material size becomes very bulky okay polymers also low and very low so as you can see we have uh, different uh, uh, physico chemical properties and uh, you can have different uh, um, grading of uh, low very low high uh, very high and so on actually okay um, when you go to the mechanical properties you remember this graph okay so metals and um, if especially when you draw a stress strain graph uh, we have the elastic region where okay the um, stress and strain are related in a linear fashion okay here stress and strain are related in a linear fashion then here we have the heel strength and this region is called the plastic region so this is the elastic region okay and this is the plastic region and the slope is called the modulus and uh, finally it breaks here so this is the ultimate strength this is the yield strength yield strength ultimate strength okay uh, for example ceramics will not have a plastic region polymers will have a lower modulus so it may go for polymers graph may go look like this okay so this region is called the elastic region uh, where the stress and strain are linearly related if you remember long time back and this is the plastic region so metals will nicely um, exhibit this type of uh, graph the stress strain diagram okay so again same metals polymers ceramics so ceramics of course do not have the plastic region uh, they have only the okay very small elastic region modulus are very very high and uh, as you can see um, polymers have the lowest modulus they are smallest toughness large toughness small toughness okay so this again this picture you remember long time back we have been comparing metals polymers and ceramics in this uh, fashion okay um, so different metals have different types of stress strain diagram for example stainless steel will look like this nitinol is a titanium alloy it will look like this much lower okay and then it goes like this okay nitinol uh, is a titanium alloy it is used in cardiovascular stents um, it's got many good properties okay um, as you can see 
the modulus is extremely low. Okay, so, metals can exhibit very large difference in this strain properties that is the advantage of metals. We can have metal, metal alloys, uh, so, to, so many different combinations and then preparation method um, and then uh, there could be heat treatment method by which uh, one could change uh, these stress strain properties dramatically. As you can see stainless steel is very, very high. Uh, if you go to titanium you may have a one lower and this particular alloy is much, much lower. So, wide range of variations could be achieved uh, um, as I said metals and their alloys preparation methods and again heat treatment methods and so on. Whereas, uh, if you take polymers we cannot achieve this type of large differences in their stress strain behavior. Okay? So, again uh, this is a very interesting picture, we will talk about this again. We have a uh, lot of difference um, between the compressive strength and the elastic modulus okay? and um, let us not go into the ceramics part, we will talk about that later. But as you can see the cortical bones have high elastic modulus and compressive strength, um, okay? cancellous bones have much lower. Um, so, polymers are able to achieve some of these dense polymers, biodegradable polymers um, and some of the bioactive ceramics could able to achieve. We will look at this diagram much later again once more. Um, again this is also a very interesting picture um, this was taken from this particular reference is called biomaterials by freeze uh, casting. Um, okay. Nickel, chromium, stainless steel they all come here. This is the fracture toughness versus zinc modulus. Fracture toughness is very, very important. So, if there is a crack that is developed in the material, how long does it last without completely breaking? That is called fracture toughness. Whereas, if you take say for example, bones, cancellous bones, low density, high density, they have very low fracture toughness. Okay? Now, as soon as there is a fracture, it will immediately break. Whereas, as soon as uh, there is a crack developed, they will immediately break. Whereas, if you take uh, these nickel metals, even if there is a crack, they will not fracture for a very, very long uh, time. That fracture toughness is very important. Okay? Um, so, as I said, these bones have very low uh, eggshell. Here comes dentin that is uh, the, uh, the um, surface portion of your tooth, cortical bone, enamel, they have quite low fracture toughness. So, ceramic calcium phosphate, silica, bioglass, okay, um, mercury amalgam, biosilicate. So, they all have much lower um, zirconia. So, some of the uh, inorganic materials are coming here, uh, some of the bone and uh, dental parts are coming here and the metals are coming here. That is they have very high fracture toughness, they have very high Young's modulus. So, if you take uh, these um, inorganic material like bioglass, ceramic, they have very high Young's modulus, but their fracture toughness is quite low as you can see here. right? So, they have very high Young's modulus, but their fracture toughness. So, if there is a small crack developed immediately, they can break okay? just like your bones here you know, as you can see. So, this is very interesting uh, figure I would say, uh, which gives you a nice idea about uh, fracture toughness versus Young's modulus. Young's modulus talks about the strength, fracture toughness talks about uh, if there is a defect developed or a crack developed, um, how long, uh, um, how tough the material is even with a defect like a crack. Okay? So, we will talk about uh, these uh, uh, issues uh, in the next class as well. Thank you very much for your time.